Thank you for listening to Emmanuel Baptist Church's podcast. For more information about the church, please visit our website at www.emmanuelmanning.com. Thanks and enjoy the sermon. We're going to read uh, tonight uh, Ephesians 1. Uh, verses 3 through 14. This is kind of a passage that we've been reading throughout this series, and as tonight is the last night in our series, Accomplished and Applied, uh, I thought it'd be good to read this again. So follow along with me as I read Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And I, I've told you this before, but just imagine it as we read in the original language, this is one sentence. So Paul just gets going and doesn't stop. Uh, Just a bunch of commas and added things, and thankfully they've broken it up for us here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Well, as I said, this is the final uh, in our series, Accomplished and Applied. And tonight, uh, we're going to look at this idea of union with Christ. That is not onion with Christ, by the way. Uh, That is union. I don't know why onion is spelled with an O and union is spelled with a U, but we'll just roll with it, okay? That's how language works. Uh, there was a uh, geometry tutor one time uh, who was teaching and said a six-sided polygon is called a hexagon, from the Greek word six, hex, hexagon. Uh, A five-sided polygon is called a pentagon. And a student asked, well, what do you call a two-sided polygon? And the teacher said, two-sided polygons don't exist. Uh, The student responded, I beg to differ. I think we should let bygones be bygones. As. Is that bad? Bygones? Go back and listen on tape if you don't understand it. Bygones be bygones. Anyway, uh, tonight we're going to look at union with Christ, which is um, a wonderful doctrine that has two sides. It's It's a bygone. Um, and we're going to look at what it means for us and uh, what we can learn from it. There are two sides to this amazing truth of union with Christ. And I can't say this enough. I can't stress this enough. Probably the thing in the Bible that we need to understand most, that we understand least, is union with Christ. If you're wondering for what that doctrine is that is most important that I understand least, it's not All the election stuff we've talked about, it's not end time stuff that we've been talking about. All of those things are important, but they're relatively unimportant compared to understanding what it means to be united with Jesus Christ. Uh, And this has an amazing uh, two sides to it. The first side of union with Christ is like what Paul said in Ephesians 1, that we are in Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul didn't call Christians Christians. Paul called Christians people who are in Christ. This is a huge doctrine, not only for Paul, 
who, if you read all of his letters and you just marked or circled every time he said in Christ or in him or in the Lord or in the beloved, you'd have a lot of markers on almost every page of Paul's epistles. Because for him, everything was about the fact that we've been united with Christ. We're in him. And so Paul, just as a one verse that kind of helps highlight this truth, Paul says in Philippians 3, 8, For his sake, Jesus' sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found where? In him. So Paul says specifically, I count everything as rubbish in order that I might be united to Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul wanted to be found, and he's talking about on that last day. On that day when I stand before God, I want to be found in Jesus. Or how about here in Paul where he says, Therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. And in reality, in the original language, I'm going to make, I'm not editing the Bible, don't worry. I'm editing the English translation. I'm not editing the, the original Really, it says something like this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is new creation. You're part of the new order that God is making and bringing. And that has all happened because we're in Christ. Uh, and so one amazing part of the truth of the union that we have with Christ is that we are in him. But the other side of this amazing truth is that Christ Jesus is in us. Can everybody see that okay? Christ is in us. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We can see here, and we're just going through uh, some scriptures, just priming the pump, warming us up. Christ lives in us. We live by faith. It's faith that puts us in Jesus. And so somehow on the basis of our believing in Jesus, we have been united with him. Or how about Colossians 1.27? Them here is the Gentiles. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. So there's a rich and glorious truth. That's a terrible underline. There's a rich and glorious truth. It's called a what? Now you remember Dave said on Sunday that mystery in the Bible doesn't mean something that's mysterious that we can't understand. What mystery means is something that was hidden and is now revealed. Uh, and what was that rich and glorious thing that was hidden and is now revealed? It's this Christ in you, that now the Son of God, Jesus, can be the animating principle of your life. And that, like Paul said, be found in him, that's the what? That's the hope of glory. One of these days when we're glorified, we see God's glory, we live in God's glory, we fully reflect God's glory, the hope of all of that will come about because Jesus is in us. And so the Bible talks about us being in Christ and Christ being in us. And when Jesus talks, guess what he does? He says both. John 15, 4 and 5, abide in me and I in you. There you go. Union with Christ. He's in us. We're in him. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And so this doctrine of union with Christ is something that we enter into by faith. And it means that somehow we're in Jesus and somehow Jesus is in us. 
These two truths are the two sides of union with Christ. And the reason I save this last is because we've gone through this whole series where we've looked at this order of salvation, election, uh, redemption, adoption, justification, regeneration, sanctification, last week glorification. And the reason that we say the union with Christ for last is because every single one of those things happens because we're united with Jesus. Every single one of those things happens because we're united with Jesus. The reason that God uh, just, that you're justified in his sight, the reason that he adopts you as his own, the reason that you're born again, the, the reason you were elected and the reason that you'll be glorified is because God sees you connected with Jesus. Here's what John Calvin says. We must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we're separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the sal salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value to us. All that Christ possesses is nothing to us until we grow into one body with him. And a lot of people think that fundamentally John Calvin taught crazy things. Fundamentally, do you know what John Calvin focused on more than anything else? I'll give you a guess. Union with Christ. Union with Christ. All of our salvation is in Jesus. So election, we've talked about this two or three weeks on it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoops. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Our election occurred in Christ. This is why John Murray says, as far back as we can go in tracing salvation to its fountain, we find union with Christ. Union with Christ is not something tacked on. Union with Christ is there from the outset. Our redemption is in Christ. We have redemption where? In Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. What is that redemption? It's the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us, it goes on to say, in the beloved. So you're redeemed because somehow you're in Jesus. You're regenerated in Christ. Remember when we talked about new birth? What does it say? We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I could have covered our adoption is in Jesus. Justification. Remember we talked about that. Justification is we're declared not guilty before God's throne for our sins and we're uh, seen as being completely righteous in Jesus. We're justified by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What's the other way of saying no condemnation? Justified. So what Paul is saying here is we are now justified in Jesus Christ. This is why as a church and as Christians, there is no such thing as too Christ-centered. Right? We're sanctified in Christ. What do we say sanctification was? It's that process of being made holy, being conformed into the image of Christ. As I said a couple of times, and I can't remember where I got this from, but our silhouette is shaped into the silhouette of Jesus as we're made more and more holy. Paul says, so also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. So you could say sanctification is becoming more and more dead to sin. In reality, in, in our practical lives, and all of this happens in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. We're glorified in Christ. 
But God, Ephesians 2 says, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so what we said last week is glorification is when what is true of us now is finally fully revealed. And that is, in Jesus, we have been raised up and vindicated and seated with him in the heavenly places. There's a sense in which, and Paul gets at this in Romans 8, you already have been glorified in Jesus. We're just waiting on this time and space to catch up with what's already true of us. And that glorification happens in Christ. So every bit of our salvation happens in Jesus. And so understanding this, this teaching about being in Christ is at the heart of what Paul and Jesus would have us understand. Even th these words, with Christ. Paul just can't say that enough. And, and if we're going to be... So let me ask you this. Is, is the Bible the foundation of our faith? I'll let that pass. I'm, this is not youth group. You don't have to yell it loud. Uh, but is the Bible the foundation of our faith? Is what it emphasizes important? One of the things it emphasizes is union with Christ. If we're going to be good Bible readers and good students and good disciples, then we need to focus on what the Bible would have us focus on. And so this idea of being in Christ, like what does it mean? What does it mean to be in Christ? Because that's a weird way of describing something. About the only thing in me right now is tortilla soup uh, and some zupa to what? Yes, all right, that, that's what's in me. Uh, some, I didn't tell my wife this, but two Murray's donuts are actually in me from earlier, babe. I'm sorry. We're supposed to be on a diet, but I drove by Murray's and I just got drug in. Um, what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, the Bible uses a lot of figures and a lot of pictures to picture this. Like Jesus is a cornerstone and we're a building or Jesus is the head and we're his body, or Jesus is the groom and we're the bride, or John 15, Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. There's no, I mean, if there was one analogy that worked, I'm sure the Bible would use it, but it uses so many analogies because it's describing something that we can't really sort of get our minds around. But somehow in God's mind, by faith, when he sees us, he always sees us as being in his son. And somehow, mysteriously, Jesus is in us by his spirit. We don't always get it, and, and because we don't always believe it to be true, we don't always see it as a reality. But nevertheless, if we believe in Jesus, it's a reality that he resides in us by his spirit. And when God looks at us, he looks at us as if we're in his son. As, as, so he can't look at us except to see Jesus. And that is an amazing thing for sinners like you and me, isn't it? But in trying to understand this, you know, it's not like I lose myself in Jesus and I become nothing and he becomes everything. No, we, we still are who we are, but we are connected somehow. And I just want to talk and give us three categories, how we can understand what it means to be in Jesus. First, thing we need to know about union with Christ is that it's covenantal. Now again, because we're so separated from the, the world of the Bible, we often don't know what this word means. Uh, we only have sort of one relationship that's still determined by a covenant. Somebody tell me what that relationship is. Yeah, it's marriage. That, that, that's about the only thing we still understand as being a covenant. So let's think through this for a minute, and maybe that'll help us understand what union with Jesus is. So there's a grave travesty that happens regularly. Do you want to know what it is? I have a job where I earn money. And lo and behold, 
without ever getting arrested, Christina Taylor can take my money and spend it. If I were to die, like she could just keep living in my house. And like she could have my cars. And like nobody does anything about the fact that Christina Taylor spends, she doesn't have a job. Yes, she does. Uh, she's, she's a homeschool mom. She's got a job. But she, doesn't, she doesn't earn money, but she spends my money. Now, why in the world? And she doesn't even ask me often. She just assumes it's true. Now, why does Christina Taylor assume it's true that she can spend my money and live in my house? Because as soon as we got married, I said, all that I have and all that I am is what? Yours. And so she, it's not my money, is it? It's, I work for, well, really her money, to be honest, because I don't have much to do with it. She gives me an allowance, and that's the way it works in our house, and that's just fine. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Um, but because we're married, everything that I have is hers. If I were to die, she'd get it. She'd get it. Because she's mine. Now, that is kind of what it means for us covenantally to be in union with Christ. It means this, that just like Christina took my name, uh, we take Jesus' name. We're called what? Christians. Little Christs. Uh, And just like Christina has been granted a claim on my stuff, you've been granted a claim on Jesus' stuff. And again, that's a good deal, all right? Because you get, if Jesus has righteousness, what do you get to claim? His righteousness. And if Jesus has been judged as being right by the Father, he's been justified, he's been vindicated, guess what you get to share in? And if Jesus, like, possessed the Holy Spirit, what do you get to, to possess as well? In other words, it's, it's like a marriage, I get Jesus' stuff. And, of course, he gets my stuff, doesn't he? What does he get? My sin and my shame. He takes upon himself. He shares my sin and my shame, and he dies for it. And he freely, out of love, nobody was twisting my arm the day I married Christina Taylor. I cried when she walked down the aisle. And, uh, man, 18 years in and a lot more to go. The same way Jesus loves me. And he willingly gave himself so that he could give me his stuff. And not only does he give me his righteousness and his sanctification, and not only does he give me his vindication and his glory, he gives me his history. And it's amazing. There's a bunch of phrases in the New Testament where Paul says, we've been crucified with Christ, we've been raised with Christ, we've been buried with Christ, we've been seated with Christ. And all those words crucified with, raised with, buried with, seated with, they're all one word. They've never been used in Greek that we can find before that. Paul just had to make up a bunch of words to try and describe this new reality. So that when God looks at you, if you're in Jesus by faith, he sees your sins as already having been crucified. He sees you as already having been raised. He looks at you as if you're Jesus. And so he loves you as if you're the apple of his eye. And it's not because you're precious, it's because his son is precious and you have found refuge in him. By the way, if you're not in Jesus, it's not like you're just blank. The Bible says we're either in Jesus or we're in who? Adam. We always tell people you need to have a relationship with Jesus or a relationship with God through Jesus. Everybody on this earth has a relationship with God. It's either through Adam or it's through Jesus. You, you want to have the Jesus one, right? And so when we talk about union with Christ, it's covenantal like a marriage because I've entered into a covenant with Jesus. He's mine forever. I'm his forever. He shares my stuff and I get his stuff. And it's a good deal. Union with Christ is spiritual. Now, whenever the word spiritual is used in the Bible, it's not used in the sense that we mean it like spiritual, right? Like spooky or extra nice or 
Hair, no, spiritual in the Bible. You don't know what spiritual in the Bible means? Having to do with the Holy Spirit. That's what spiritual means. It means Holy Spirit stuff. And so I have this picture here of Jesus praying in the garden because the union that we have with Jesus is spiritual. Spiritual in a couple of ways. First of all, that our union with Jesus is created by the Spirit. Listen to what this says. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Our union with Christ is spiritual in that it begins with the Holy Spirit. But our, our union with Christ is spiritual also in the sense that not only is it like covenantal in that I get his stuff, but it's spiritual in the sense that he gives me his spirit so that I begin to feel things like he did. So it's more than just covenantal. It's spiritual. I'm not just married to Jesus. It's like I have a part of him in me making me love the things that he loves and hate the things that he hates. And that spirit gives me the ability to pray like Jesus prayed, and it gives me the same sort of groanings that Jesus had. That's why I have this picture up here of Jesus just praying in the garden, saying, Abba, uh, if it be your will, let this pass from me. In his darkest moments, Jesus was able to call out to God as his father, And Jesus has given that spirit to me so that I am becoming like him because I have his spirit. Paul says, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, fear of God. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And I think Paul chooses this on purpose because who is the one who called Jesus Abba? Who called the Father Abba? So this is a crazy thing. One of the reasons that Jesus came and took up flesh is so that he could be a spirit-directed man so that dying as our Savior, he could then give his spirit to us. Which means, for those of us who really do know God in our deepest and darkest moments, even though things look really, really scary, and even though they look really rough and we feel alone, we know we're not alone. Because we've been given His Spirit. So our union with Christ is not only covenantal, like a legal relationship, where we're like married, but also we share the same Spirit. It is amazing, the longer that Christina and I are married, uh, the more alike we become. And I've told you this story before, there's no way, had I not married Christina, that I would like Jane Austen. But you can't be married to Christina Taylor and not be exposed on a regular basis to Jane Austen. Uh, And so... Now, I I like Jane Austen, and when she and Ellie are watching Jane Austen movies or whatever, I just find myself in the chair looking at them and, like, crying when finally Eleanor Dashwood gets her man, and, you know, when Mr. Darcy, finally, they come around. Like, I love all that stuff, and that happens as a result of being married to Christina, and as we bounce off of one another year after year, our moral impulses, I think, become more and more alike. In the same way, by virtue of our union with Jesus, we don't just get his stuff, we get his spirit. So union with Christ is covenantal, union with Christ is spiritual, and then union with Christ is vital. And what does vital mean? Yeah, necessary for living. Necessary for living. Union with Christ. In in other words, what I mean by this is our spiritual life comes by virtue of being united with Christ. Jesus says, abide in me, and I in you. Just like the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. I mean, 
If you take the branch of an orange tree off of it and plug it in like a bucket of water in your house, are any of us really going to be that surprised if oranges don't grow on it? I said orange tree at first, didn't I? I didn't want to change trees midway. Um, We would not be, because the orange tree branch has to be connected to something to bear fruit, right? Now, what's crazy is if you take an orange tree branch and you connect it to a different kind of tree, it'll bear fruit and the fruit will be different and it'll be weird, uh, but it'll be unique and it'll bear fruit. A branch has got to be connected to a vine or to a tree in order to bear fruit. And that's what Jesus says here. Unless you abide in me, you can't bear fruit. Jesus is pretty clear here. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, let's be good Bible readers. Do lost people do things all the time? Yes. It's kind of like calling people dead. Well, they're spiritually dead. They're not physically dead. In the same way, lost people and all kinds of Christians who don't abide in Jesus do things all the time. When Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, he means apart from me, you can do nothing spiritually good. We could meet every Sunday, and I could probably, I mean, lost people preach sermons all the time, right? Uh, And lost people listen to sermons on a regular basis. For spiritual fruit to happen, we've got to be connected to Jesus, because apart from him, we can do nothing. And that's what I mean when I say this connection with Jesus is vital. It's necessary for life. And when Jesus says, abide in me, he tells us what that means a little further down. If you abide in my words. In other words, if you, if you live your days listening to my words, and if you live your days seeking to have a spiritual connection with me, uh, you'll bear a lot of fruit. We can know all of the evangelistic principles in the world Now, we can have all of the Bible verses in the world memorized, but if we're not abiding in Jesus, they're not doing us any good. Let me, can I read you a long, nerdy quote now? It's about that time in the sermon where I read a long, nerdy quote. Are you ready for a long, nerdy quote? We're going to talk about the western branch and the eastern branch of the church. Now, when we talk about the western branch of the church, we're talking about the Catholic church and all Protestant denominations, right? When we're talking about the Eastern Church, we're talking about any church that sort of has Orthodox in its name. So Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Bulgarian Orthodox, I don't know. There's all kinds of Orthodox churches, okay? This is the West, and this is the East. It has to do with the split of Rome in 1054, kids. Uh, But we'll let that go for right now. Listen to what he says here. This is connected to the idea of vital The Western branch of the Christian church tended to emphasize the legal side of Christ's work. The aspect of sin emphasized was guilt, which Christ took away by atonement, by which he made satisfaction and thus paid our debt. The greatest blessing in salvation was justification. The Eastern wing of the church, however, was more inclined to see the vital or life-sharing side of Christ's work. The aspect of sin emphasized was not legal guilt, but pollution, which Christ took away by joining us to himself through incarnation. The greatest blessing of salvation in the Eastern Church was sanctification. For the Western Church, the central boon of the Christian life was forgiveness, whereas for the Eastern Church, it was everlasting life. The Western Church tended to accent the Christ who is for us. The Eastern Church, on the other hand, was more inclined to celebrate the Christ who is in us. We must always keep these two aspects of Christ's work together, the legal and the vital, Christ for us and Christ in us. And that's why this doctrine of union with Christ is so important, because union with Christ helps us to do just that. Nerdy quote done. Let's apply this. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to get a few things into your head and for me to get a few things into my head. And one of them is this, is that one of the number one ways that Satan lies to us 
is by getting us to believe that God looks at us apart from Jesus. And any time the devil can make you believe that God looks at you apart from Jesus, he's got you guilty, he's got you separated, and he has you right where he wants you. But if you realize that by faith you're married to Jesus and Jesus doesn't leave anybody at the altar, the more you realize that God looks at every single one of us through Jesus, uh, the better your relationship with God will be. You never look at God apart from the cross and you never believe that God looks at you apart from Jesus. If you can get that one concept in your head, your Christian life will be loads better because you'll live in a little something called freedom. Okay? Now, if your relationship with Jesus is as secure as marriage, then we should grow in marriage. So I've used the illustration of me and Christina. Are Christina and I more married, less married, or the same amount of married as we were at 4 o'clock, December 30th, the year 2000? Legally speaking, we're just as married as we ever were. The legal status doesn't change, okay? But throughout the years, have we grown into the marriage? Man, by God's grace, along with a few bad days and three pregnancies, yes. We have, I think, I think we've, and we still have issues. Man, to live with a sensitive curmudgeon like me is difficult, and Christina has her own issues, but I only talk about mine from the pulpit. Uh, but as we live longer in marriage, I think we learn more and we, we love more and you get nicknames over time and you have stories to look back on and you have victories that you've done together and, um, and it's just you grow, you grow up into it. And that's what we need to do with the Lord. We're not more married because we're closer to Jesus than we were 10 years ago. We're just growing up into the covenantal relationship that we have with Jesus. And that's what we need to see, that on our worst day, we're still married, but let's just continue by grace to work and to grow. Number two, in various moments in your life, the most important thing you can do is remember that you're in Christ. For Paul, this was just vital. For John, this was vital. For Jesus, this was vital. So when you feel as though God has abandoned you, what would it mean for you in that moment to believe what Paul says when he says we've been seated with Jesus in the heavenly places? When you feel like God's abandoned you, you're, you're right next to him because you're in Christ. And so that should give you the confidence to pray to him and to trust God for good things. When you feel as though sin has the upper hand in your life, and you sort of are being tempted in that one area that always gets you, you need to remember that you've been raised with Jesus and you've been given the Holy Spirit so that while you may sin, you never actually have to sin. Can I get an amen that you understand? You never actually have to sin because you're in Jesus. And Paul says if we've been baptized with him and raised to walk in newness of life with him, then we are under no obligation to the flesh to obey it. Sin lies to you and gains power over you. You've done this a million times, and it's just a matter of time. It is not just a matter of time. It's a matter of faith. We do not ever have to sin. God has given us a power in the Holy Spirit, and Paul says God has also always given us a way of what? Escape. We never have to sin. And part of sin's power over us is making us believe that we do. You don't actually have to fall into that same rut of communication, of backbiting, of sin, of bitterness. You actually do not have to do that. When your mind is dominated by things people have said about you, I'm reading a book right now on gender dysphoria. We should have mercy on people who are experiencing gender dysphoria. They should probably hear the truth about gender from the church, 
but they should hear it wrapped in a big old hug. If people who suffer from gender dysphoria should be loved anywhere, they should be loved by people who are just really jacked up in different ways. Right? One of the things that 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 particular group and all of us in our own way struggle with is our minds are dominated by things that people have said about us or dominated by things that people have done to us. And what you need to realize is this, is that the thing that is most true about you is the stuff that's true about Jesus. What do I mean by that? Paul, you've been crucified with Christ. So if people say you're guilty, I've heard of children who went to this church who were called cancer by their parents. Imagine what that does to you. Um, Or if your mind constantly flashes back to things that people have done to you, like that's the history that determines your future. The history that determines your future is that about 2,000 years ago in God's mind you were crucified and all that bad stuff was buried into the ground and then you walked out with Jesus and now you sit at God's right hand. That is the most true thing about you. That's your history because you're in Jesus. And we could overcome so much if we would actually understand that that's the case. You are the stuff that happened to you, that defines you, that's the stuff Jesus took. You get his history, he takes yours. And the sooner that we can grab onto that, the sooner that we can live in victory and we're no longer dominated by the things that have happened to us. That doesn't make them irrelevant. That doesn't mean that we don't need to do some work, but most of the work is in believing that what God says is true of you is true of you. When you feel really unfruitful and unproductive, you need to remember that if you abide in Jesus and he abides in you, then there's a promise there. It's a, it's a crazy promise. Are you ready? The crazy promise is that if you abide in Jesus and he abides in you, that you will bear much fruit. Does he say you might bear some fruit? He says you will bear much fruit. So if we're a relatively unfruitful church, then what is our problem? That preacher, man, he's terrible, right? Those Sunday school classes are awful. Uh, Wins, we don't pray, you know, we, we don't do this, we don't do that. We don't, what don't we do? We don't abide. Because if we ab- abode in Christ, and if he abides in us, then we will bear much fruit. If you feel fruitless, it's not complicated. Isn't that a beautiful truth? You just need to abide in Christ and have his words abide in you. So as we wrap up this series on the order of salvation, there pretty much just is one thing in the order of salvation. Are you ready? In Jesus. In Jesus. And that's why we want to be Christ-centered, and that's why we constantly want to hold the gospel forth, and that's why we want to hold Jesus out as the only hope of people, because Jesus is the only hope of people. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, help us to believe that by faith we have been placed in Jesus, that we have the Spirit of Christ, and that as we remain connected to him, we can experience life and life to the full, fruitful life. Lord, help us not to be dominated by what has happened to us in the past. There are plenty of things to deal with, plenty of ramifications to face. But Father, our history is that we have died with Christ. And so leaving the things behind, we press forward, laying the rubbish aside, seeking to be found in him. God, give us grace to abide in Jesus that we might be fruitful. We pray this all in his name, for his sake, for his glory and his glory alone. Amen. Y'all have an awesome week. We'll see you Sunday.